Hi, I'm Adam Natale, director of SVA Theater at the School of Visual Arts. If you've never heard of SVA, we're a preeminent art and design college in New York City. Check the description below for more info. Since 2014, SVA Theater has hosted After School Special, the college's annual alumni film and animation festival. The festival is normally a series of free screenings followed by Q&As with alumni who are successfully working in the film industry. Even though we're unable to host in-person screenings this year, we're thrilled to be able to present interviews with over 25 alumni who've worked on a wide variety of feature films, television shows, documentaries, animated films, and more. Whether tonight's Q&A focuses on a particular series, film, or other work, we'll be sure to note it in the description below and we'll provide info on how to watch. All of our festival interviews will premiere here on YouTube during the week of September 21st. We're calling this our work from home edition of After School Special, and our guests are zooming in from all over the world, from Singapore and Germany to Canada and California. A full schedule of After School Special 2020 interviews can be found at svatheater.com, but all videos will remain on YouTube following their premieres. I hope you enjoyed tonight's interview, and if you're interested in viewing past After School Special Q&As, you can visit the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in, and fingers crossed, we hope to see you in person at an SVA Theater event in the near future. Hi, I'd like to welcome Vashti Kala, a 2004 graduate of SVA's BFA film program. Vashti is a multi-hyphenate in the best sense of the word, whose incredible career is not easy to define. She's an entrepreneur, a filmmaker, artist, designer, model, creative consultant, and DJ, amongst many other titles. Vashti has directed commercials and videos for Justin Bieber, Kid Cudi, Kendrick Lamar, and Solange, among many others. She's helped revamped Island Def Jam. She was featured on the Showtime docuseries 3AM. She has her own clothing and lifestyle brand, Violet, and in 2010, she became the first woman to design an Air Jordan. She has thousands upon thousands of followers on social media and her website, Vashti.com, which we'll put down in the information section, is continuously updated with a wide variety of content, including news, videos, DJ mixes, and lifestyle tips and recommendations, including her own vegan cookie recipe. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have her here. Let's welcome Vashti Kala. Hey Vashti, how are you? Hey, I'm good, how are you doing? Good, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, I'd first like to start off, since this is the SVA Alumni Film Festival, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your SVA experience when you were at the school. Wow, my SVA experience was actually really great. Um, you know, I had the option of going to other schools, other film schools, art schools, and I, I kind of like narrowed down an SVA because I really felt a connection there, even though I didn't, I actually didn't even take a tour of the dorms and I ended up being at the dorms. I just knew I wanted to be at SVA, which is not something I suggest at all. But, um, but I really felt connected to the school immediately and loved that the film program, because other programs, other film programs, you weren't allowed to maybe touch cameras in the first year. So SVA was one of the reasons, well, they, the fact that they had students you know using cameras the first year was part of the reason why I wanted to go there um and honestly I loved it I just I felt like the experience that I had was really sort of um you know it was hands-on and I think for me as someone who's very like do it yourself and you know figure it out like I loved having that experience and I feel like when I talked to other kids who were in film school they didn't have like a similar experience so I was really grateful for that um and also in general, I think, you know, I had grown up in Albany, New York, which is fairly, you know, it's the capital of New York, but definitely not New York City. But coming to New York City for school at SVA was quite amazing because there was also kids from around the world. And I got to meet so many incredible people from so many different countries. And just the experience that I got, like, educationally was incredible, but also I feel like the experience of, you know, 
growing and maturing with these other kids that were from so many different parts of the world was really also what helped shape me and shaped my vision. Um, but I loved it. I actually was there for four years. I did directing for four years and then I really wanted to spend more time with cinematography. So I did an extra year of cinematography. Um, but yeah, it was a great experience. That's awesome. And so, um, you know, you mentioned you were sort of crossing into other artistic territory. Can you tell us a little about your thesis film and how it involved uh, animation? Yeah, so um, at the time I was really, I mean, I, I grew up in love, being in love with animation, but definitely 3D animation was like something I really wanted to delve into. And at the time, you know, those departments weren't sort of like kind of intermixed, but, um, you know, I knew people that were in the 3D like classes and in the animation department. So I was able to collaborate with some of those guys. And um, yeah, I basically made a short uh, film for my thesis, which was um, centered around the idea of AI, which is really funny because I don't think that I'm like a super AI person, but it was it was a love story that involved AI. Um, and it was really an intense process because I mean if you can imagine in 2004 3D animation I mean we've come a long way but uh um but yeah it was a really intense process but um but it was great you'll have to put that video on your website at some point so we can take a look <laughs> yeah. um so uh you know I'd love to hear about your career trajectory like maybe let's start with immediately after graduation. I know you're very much involved with the downtown music scene. Did that come during school or right after? Or, you know, what was next after graduation for you? So being in New York City for, you know, school, for art school and film school was incredible because it's like you have inspiration, like just walking down the street, you know, there were so many nightclubs, so many parties. I um, mean, of course I was underage, so I was sneaking into things. Um, but, you know, so for me, I was sort of, I came from the world of like loving hip hop and like punk rock and skate and all of those things. So when I came to New York City, I basically copied all of the things that I had been doing in Albany where I grew up. So in Albany, I would hang out at the skate shop. So when I moved to New York, I started hanging out at Supreme and, uh, you know, I would go to music shops in Albany. But, you know, when I moved here, then I, in New York City, I would start going to Fat Beats, which doesn't exist anymore. But um, so for me, I just sort of like copied what my like routines were. And in that sense, it sort of really helped me because those, those shops and I mean, obviously Supreme were very like, you know, very underground cool. Now it's like much more known, but I um, mean, at the time it wasn't like a known thing, but I think that also helped shape me because I was able to meet all kinds of other people, you know, other people who went on to start their own brands, um, and just being a part of that kind of growth that sort of helped me you know also do things other than film like I was I loved film I was obsessed with it but I also liked other things you know I was obsessed with sneakers and I loved music and going to parties and um so for me I think that like my trajectory has been quite confusing, especially for my parents, because they're like, what do you actually do? Um, but I feel like all of my interests, I've been able to sort of like spin into a career somehow, but not even consciously of it. Um, so it's been really nice. It's just, you know, having taken my authentic experiences or interests and being able to sort of like turn that into something has been really nice. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it, well, it sounds like, you know, while being, being at SVA, because you were in New York, that really shaped your artistic sensibilities and, and, and contributed to your creativity. So, you know, and, and you're still in New York. So when you're directing and designing and DJing and creating in general, do you feel that the same like New York energy is influencing that creativity or do you sort of get that those creative impulses from other places as well at this point? Um, it's a mix. It's, I feel like it's mostly New York city. And, and to me, that means 
like an inspiration where I don't have to necessarily be here. Like I grew up not living in New York city. And for me, New York city was always an inspiration. Like I've always wanted to come here and live here and, and work here. But, you know, I think, you know, as we're in this sort of, you know, zoom virtual era, I don't think you necessarily need to have the experience not to say that it's, you know, of course it would be great to have it right now, but I think that you can still tap into it. And so for me, even when I didn't live here, I tapped into it, which was really helpful to me. Um, and even now, like, you know, now that I'm socially distant and kind of just functioning just from my apartment, there's, you know, not necessarily anything from those nightlife worlds or fashion worlds or anything that is directly inspiring me, but, you know, having the, having the sense of things, having the memory of things, but also, you know, we have the internet, which is extremely helpful. I mean, when I was really young, for me to explore New York City, it was like, you know, watching TV or, you know, reading magazines. So I feel like, you know, while we're in this weird place, um, I can still find inspiration from, from New York. Um, I think also, you know, other cities do inspire me too, even like small towns. Like, I mean, I could be reading about a, you know, a small group of kids who, you know, started some like wild dance and, you know, it's catching all over the world. So things like that also inspire me too. Um, and I think that when it comes to, when it comes to most of my work, it's very much New York is the inspiration, but depending on if I'm doing a job for, you know, a brand that's like based in Paris or, you know, a brand that's like from South Africa, like I'll take into consideration what works for their crowd and for their following. But also I stay true to like what is me. And I think essentially that's always kind of New York. Um, can we talk a little bit about the design? You have your own lifestyle brand, Violet. And I mean, you're the, uh, even my, our tech director, when he heard you design the, you know, the first woman to design an Air Jordan, he kind of freaked out. And I think it's, <laughs> it's so cool. But can you talk about, you know, how you got into design, especially for fashion, since that, you know, that's not what you necessarily went to school for. And talk a little bit about the other brands you've designed for as well, including, including Jordans. Yeah, so... Um, so growing up when I was really young, I was super into art, which is like every other kid, right? Like, I feel like we're natural creators. Um, some of us lose it along the way, but I think that, you know, for me, I was very fortunate that I didn't lose it. So, you know, from the time I could remember, I was always painting and drawing. And even at the age of like 10, I was like, I'm moving to New York. I'm going to be an artist. Um, and for me, my background was more fine arts, like drawing, painting. So when I was in high school, I knew I wanted to go, I, want, I knew I wanted to pursue art. I just didn't know in what realm, but I was always sketching clothes and taking photos and making short films with friends. Um, and for me, I think a lot of those things of creativity came out of, um, you know, not having enough. Like I grew up sort of poor and could not afford Jordans. Like I never had a name brand pair of sneakers. Um, and it wasn't until I got like an after school job that I could afford that myself. And, you know, for me, when I, when I was in high school, especially, I would draw clothes. I was like obsessed with, you know, designing things like things that I wanted to wear or things that inspired me. So that sort of background for me was there. I mean, I don't know how precise or, you know, tech it was, but it was definitely just me like envisioning the world I wanted to live in or creating the clothes that I wanted to wear. So going to SVA for me was definitely a focus on film, which I knew I wanted to study because I felt like I didn't really, I couldn't really find information on like, like the technical aspect of film, you know, like everything from, you know, developing or, you know, lenses and all those things. So for me, I knew I was going to study film, but I always had in the back of my head that I might do clothing on the side. And uh, again, it might sound like, okay, slow down. But, you know, I think that for a lot of artists out there, especially now, it's sort of like the era that you are sort of a jack of all trades. Anyways, I, um, I took silk screening classes while I was at SVA. And so I was able to sort of explore that world, sort of coming up with graphic t-shirts and printing those. Um, 
so that sort of was part of like my DNA, whether or not it was like very structured or uh, advanced. Um, so I also have to mention because the, the story of the Jordan is sort of like fragmented of how it even happened. But so because I couldn't afford sneakers growing up and Jordans growing up, especially in the hood, are like the epitome of like the top notch sneaker. I got obsessed with them and then you know moving to new york then also having another you know like like side job i was able to like buy sneakers and support a habit <laughs> of this addiction to sneakers and then i worked at stucy which um is under the supreme umbrella so james jebbia who owns supreme also owns stucy in new york well he did at the time and so any sneaker drop that came out i was able to have like immediately and i was sort of known as a girl who wore Jordans. Um, and even at that time in the early 2000s, it was not common. Like girls in the hood wore for that. And it was like definitely like a thing. But like I was living in Manhattan, going to film school, working in Soho, and girls in Soho did not dress like that whatsoever. Like it was, you know, it was definitely a very distinct line of who wore Jordans and streetwear. So for me, I was maneuvering going to like all of these like cool clubs, like sneaking in with my friends and trying to get into parties and being turned away at some places because I was dressed like a tomboy and wearing Jordans. But it sort of helped, you know, my style sort of like kind of got ingrained in people's memory. Like, oh, like that's how she dresses. That's her thing. For some people, it was like, oh, that's really cool. But other people thought it was really <laughs> uncool. Um, so I think that that sort of helped my um I don't know like just like that, that helped my story so years went by um after I graduated and I was just like working and um I think at that time I was working at Def Jam maybe and I had run no, no no I had a birthday party sorry so I had a birthday party and then for my birthday party I wanted to have a Jordan 3 birthday cake because I was obsessed with Jordans and then at that time, blogs were sort of like just developing. It was like the mid 2000s and uh, Hypebeast had covered it. Like a lot of people had like reblogged the, the birthday cake and it became like its own thing. Um, and then a couple weeks later, I ran into a friend who I knew had worked in the sneaker world. And uh, we were talking and I was like, oh, did you see my sneaker cake? And he's like, no, I, I didn't see it. And so he's like, oh my God, that's right. You're obsessed with Jordans. And he's like, do you know, I'm working at Brand Jordan now. And I'm like, no way. And he's like, okay, you know, let's talk tomorrow. And, you know, in New York or any major city, people are like, yeah, let's, let's work together. Let's talk. So I didn't really t like think much of it. And then the next day we really were like on the phone talking about me designing a Jordan 2, which was mind blowing. I mean, it's still mind blowing and it happened like almost 10 years ago, but, um, but yeah, it was a very natural progression. And, uh, I'm still shocked. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Um, I want people to see some photos of your work, uh, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about it. There's a bit of your fashion work, and then there is a there are some screen grabs from some of your music videos, uh, and I'd love to hear about those as well. So we're gonna throw those up, and we'll let you flip through them for our audience. Okay, so this came after the Jordan. I did a collaboration with G-Shock um, and it was amazing because um, they approached me about doing any kind of G-Shock I wanted. And also, you know, for me growing up, G-Shock was also a name brand item that I could not afford. And even coming to New York City and knowing, like I would go to the G-Shock store and check out the G-Shocks, but I never actually had one. Um, and it's cool that things can come full circle, basically. Anyway, so um, they approached me about doing a G-Shock and I really wanted to do one that was modeled off of a presidential Rolex. So that is why it's all gold. I'm also like obsessed with gold. So, um, so it sort of worked out. And it was great because they allowed me the creative freedom to like come up with like, you know, the lookbook and, you know, how I want to model it and shoot it and then doing, you know, a press event and then a party. So. Um, they were really great to work with. And again, I think just having, you know, having a background in art, but also having a vision of like what I wanted to do really helped it 
Um, you know, and I think that because I'd practiced it as a kid, like drawing it out, you know, when a brand approached me about doing something, I, I was maybe a little frightened to tell them like, I'm not a real designer, but I also was like, I'm not going to lose this opportunity. So just some advice for you guys out there. If this is something that you want to do, like, it's always great to just like, even if you feel like you're not prepared, just like learn it on the way. <laughs> Cause that's kind of what I did. And here is the Jordan that I designed. And um, yeah, it's basically, it was inspired by my brand Violet. It was a part of a collaboration with my brand Violet also, my brand Violet. Um, and the color for my brand is representative of sort of like a gender fluidity. It's, um, you know, red and blue combined and sort of, you know, I wanted the color to be like a very pale, sort of gender neutral sort of um like purple i wanted this was a, a woman's shoe but i wanted a shoe that guys wanted to lust after because for a lot of women in the sneaker world um not so much now i mean they're kind of evolving but back in the day like they always dropped cool sneakers for guys and never for girls and so it always sucked so i kind of was you know kind of being playful with it like i wanted the sneaker to be feminine enough, but also a masculine kind of shoe that guys couldn't have. Um, and yeah, that's the Jordan too. Well, I'd wear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and so a couple years later, um, I did a collaboration with Puma. They reached out, um, the Puma premium brand, which is based in Europe. They wanted me to do like a full two season collection of apparel, and footwear and this is a pair of shoes out of like I want to say like 15 pairs we did so many silhouettes of, of shoes um, and the idea of this pair I believe was sort of inspired by like 80s hip-hop b-boy era because for me when you know I did Puma for two seasons and the first season was um, definitely hip-hop urban like kind of inspired by the the artwork of Jamel Shabazz where he kind of has a book I think it's um back in the days yes and it's sort of like a lot of the people in those um photographs are wearing Puma and so we sort of did a collection that was inspired by that era and then the second collection was not here but it's um but it was inspired by like 90s grunge and like riot girls uh and like the skate culture so and this is a collaboration I did with Varnay. Um, I'm probably saying that completely wrong. It's a French brand, um, but they were great. We did a small run of eyewear um, sunglasses. And yeah, it was just a really fun project. This was like super easy. They were super easy to work with and very quick turnaround, which was really nice. my little signature which i did not want but they were like let's just put your logo on it and i'm like okay <laughs> and here is a perfect example of a job in 2020 so um so this is me um acting in a short video that i directed for truly truly is um a brand that makes sparkling like you know, spirit, like kind of refreshments, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, maybe your parents are. Um, and so basically they approached me and they're like, oh, we want you to do an unboxing and put it on your YouTube. And so for me, having the background in film, I was like, oh, instead of me being on my phone, you know, like doing a selfie sort of like video, I was like, it would be so much cooler if we just like made like if I directed and produced like a little short film about how I would drink truly and so again that's like a little bit of advice for you if you're interested in blending your work with being an influencer I mean I don't know how some of you feel about that word it's it's conflicting for me but it is what it is so um you know a lot of jobs come to me and I I feel like I don't want to just get lost in the sauce of being like the influencer. So I'm like, Oh, how can I make this more of a, a job that represents me or how can I utilize my talents? So basically this is how I did it. I made like a little short film for truly, which I think they really liked. 
And this is a still from a music video that I had directed for Joey Badass, who was very young at the time. I think he had just turned 17. Um, and also, you know, being like a little dirtbag art kid at art school, I learned, you know, you just kind of make it work, right? So like this shot we stole, we weren't allowed to be on this rooftop. We just like snuck in and got it, which I don't, I won't recommend because I don't want to get any of you in trouble. But we, you know, if you're kind of handy and you are, you know, do it yourself, um, it was a way to get an incredible shot. So um, this to me was like very classic hip hop. Um, like moment for his his career um and it was a lot of fun to shoot and this is a still he is so young from justin bieber's video one time which i directed many years ago i want to say it was 2009 um and it was incredible at you know at the time i was uh asked to come up with a concept for him and you know being like a kid who was like obsessed with films from the 80s and 90s I was like oh what if he had like this house party and invited all these like like wild kids and they had like a wild party so that was sort of the inspiration for this video um and at the same time it was cool because he was so young at the time and to see how his career has sort of like just evolved incredibly it's really nice to have been a part of it um especially at that time like just meeting him he was just like a regular cool kid like he wasn't you know a like puppet that was being like you know I know that sounds awful but you know sometimes young kids in the industry are kind of like told what to say and what to do and he was very much his own person and um very sweet and and just talented and had a very specific vision for himself which I thought was cool and this is a video I did for Kendrick Lamar who at the time had just dropped his mixtape um and he was fairly, I won't say unknown, but he wasn't obviously the Kendrick Lamar that we know now. Um, he, at the time, was working with my manager. And so um, my manager was like, oh, I have this new kid that I'm working with. And we are looking to get some videos done. We don't have a budget. We don't really have a budget. And I was like, okay, great. Like, I listened to his mixtape. I loved it. I thought he was really interesting and cool. And um, this was for the song ADHD, which is a very beautiful song. And again, we shot all of this, no permits, nothing, just shooting. What I learned being in art school is that if you're filming on the street and someone is like, oh, who are you? What are you doing here? Usually if you say you're a student, they'll leave you alone. So I think I, I still carry with that, that little um, student uh, excuse. But anyway, this was shot on a at a bodega on Avenue A in New York City and uh it was a lot of fun. So I mean it, it looks like you were on the cutting edge with a lot of these <laughs> with a lot of a lot of these stars like at the beginnings of their career. Um it's it's really amazing all, all the stuff you've done. Is there any is there any particular type of creating that you like to do more than another? Do you like the fashion? Do you like the film? Or, you know, what do you find yourself sort of honing in on most of the time? You know, I think for me, directing was, directing music videos was such an incredible experience. Working with artists and kind of like collaborating with them on a vision and coming up with something that worked, you know, for their brand and for their, their fan base and also telling like a, an interesting, compelling story at the same time. I think for me, part of um, the reason why I maybe slowed down with directing music videos is because a lot of artists, you know, are now with labels and then the label has a lot more say in it, which is totally fine. But I think for me years ago, it was sort of like an experience that I wasn't necessarily fully prepared for. And I don't think you can be, it's just sort of part of the business and you learn along the way. Um, so for me, I think that I really appreciated doing things with artists and it being like a real reflection of their vision and my vision um, without sort of having, you know, the issues of product placement and then what does the choreographer want, manager want. And so it's just, um, I think for me, I still love directing music videos specifically because I feel like um, 
when it's the right combination, it can really create something that's really beautiful. Um, but again, you know, like filmmaking is sort of a lengthy experience. Like it's a lengthy process compared to DJing, which is like much instant, you know, like for me, I think that I love DJing because I'm able to get that response of seeing what's working and what's not working. Um, but I also feel like it's, it's hard because they're so different. Right. And then also with, with fashion, it's the same thing. It's like, you can design something, but you know, I designed the Jordan in 2009 and a year later it came out. So, um, so, but sometimes those things are worth the wait. Um, but then, you know, there's other things that are much quicker. So I don't know. It's really hard to say. It's hard. Um, talking a little bit about your, you know, music video experience and you've done commercials and some like short art videos as well. Um, can you talk about your experience as a woman of color in that industry and uh, if there have been any challenges or, or just hearing about your overall experience would be great. Yeah, I think, you know, in the beginning of my career, it was very rare that like a woman of color that looked like me maybe um, was interested in working behind the camera. And I mean, if you look at the history of music videos, it's often, you know, a girl that might look like me who's in front of the camera, who's, you know, like the model or the actress in the video. So sometimes I would walk into offices for, you know, to pitch myself for a job. And, you know, I've had guys tell me like, okay, yeah, you're, you're, you're really here because you want a model. <laughs> like, okay. That's why I'm in debt to the, to SVA, no. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I did have moments of definite, like, you know, sexism. Um, but for me, having grown up with, like, boys and sort of being a tomboy, I was sort of, like, not even phased by it. But it definitely was something that, you know, I would hear from time to time. Um but I think that now it's definitely evolving and changing for the better. So that's really exciting. Um, I think that part of me being like a rare, I, I want to say rare in quotes because there were other, there are, were other women like me at the time, but um, it wasn't as, you know, and now where, you know, you could also, be a girl who is twerking on her Instagram and then also directing. Like at that time, it was like, you were very like serious about your craft. And, you know, there's a difference between this kind of a person and that kind of a person. But, um, you know, so for me, I feel like I, I did experience, you know, sexism, but I also think that because I was not like a common kind of person coming in and out of their office, I was also given more opportunities probably um and also being connected with artists in general like you know I was friends with Cuddy before he got signed I was friends with you know uh Theophilus London and um other artists like the cool kids and even Drake when I met Drake he had just come out with his next tape I don't think he was signed yet so I think that that also helped my you know my persona I guess or what people thought of me creatively so um, I was also just aligned with like the right people, I guess. Yeah, well, I, like I said, it seems that you've launched all of these people's <laughs> careers, so it's pretty awesome. I mean, being being on the ground floor and seeing seeing how they've grown, um, you know, it sounds like you you have had some influence on their career, whether it's creating a music video or just working alongside of them. Um, so, you know, who's next? <laughs> Uh, who should we look out for next? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think that right now I haven't been, um, you know, discovering much. Part of the discovery that I have to say was part of my natural journey of meeting all these artists was being out and being at the right place and seeing someone. So I think that while we're you know, it's not, it's not impossible and it's not stopping the process, I think, but what's happening is that we're readdressing how we're discovering and I'm re I'm kind of reassessing how I'm discovering new artists. Um, for me, it was always about like a genuine conversation or watching a performance or something. So I think now I'm just relearning different ways of how to discover. 
So nothing right now that I can say of, but I'm sure something soon. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you're working during the pandemic. Has, is there anything specific that you're working on and how are you staying motivated and energized creatively? Um, so right now, I think that, you know, when COVID started, it was sort of like, you know, there was a definite adjustment of like, okay, how do I still create in this space? And I definitely didn't focus on the fact of, you know, the details of what was happening. I also feel like we as creators, we figure out new solutions to problems. And so for me, I was like, you know, I wanted to be of support to my community and whether that's just the people that follow me or the people that are just googling for you know ideas of things so for me i went straight to my blog and i was like writing so i was like you know writing how to like live without toilet paper and like you know how to you know you know at the time also you know groceries were hard to come by so it was like how to make a recipe with like just a few things so coming up with ways that were like fun and creative but that also helped me um i think what happened for me in my real creative world was that i sort of took a break um from focusing on projects because i also was maintaining my sense of self and sort of like trying to um, make sense of everything. So for me, it was definitely figuring out new routines. I started doing Instagram live DJ sets, which was really therapeutic for me, just being able to play music and like talk to people with their, you know, like commenting and replying to them. That was really helpful. But then definitely I had been hospitalized for a kidney infection and then my cat passed away. And then right after all of that happened, then it was, you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. So a lot of things were happening in the world. And I think as an artist, I retreated more because I was also trying to figure out how to, how to be of service as a human being, first and foremost, be, even before being a creator. So I think that really kind of took um, precedence in my life you know, going to protests, signing petitions, donating, but also finding all of the black owned businesses that I could and sharing that and sort of trying to be more of service. Um, but now that that's sort of, and it's still happening and it's now it's just part of the day to day for a lot of us. Um, but now as a creative, I think I'm able to sort of come back to myself and figure out what are some creative ways I can also be of service but also as a creative, how do I also maintain my sense of self and, you know, kind of keep myself balanced at a, at a time like this? So, um, you know, for me, definitely music, DJing is helpful. Um, and I'm very fortunate while my DJing in public has sort of disappeared, um, I'm able to do a lot more, you know, quote unquote influencer work, which is really helpful to me. Um, and so, yeah, so I think now it's just like, it's been waves and now I'm coming back to like myself of like, okay, what can I do? What can I do with just me, like without a team of people? And so it's sort of like a return to my roots, you know, like being in my bedroom and like creating zines or drawing or, you know, making short films by myself, so. And I think that's representative from the content that's on your website. It's such a wide variety. Like you said, you know, you have recipes up there and, you know, health and wellness content, and you also have Black Lives Matter content. And I think you're right. It's what we're all going through right now. Um, so I think that that's really interesting to hear, especially as some artists are trying to figure out and process everything right now. Um, so sort of separate from pandemic artistry um, and, and creativity. I'd love for you to offer some advice for students who are looking to do some of the things that you're doing. And I know that you cast such a wide net in terms of what you do, but maybe let's focus on being that sort of entrepreneur creator. Like how can someone, how can someone get to that next level uh, in terms of their artistry and become their their own business or their own entrepreneur like you have um 
very loaded question, but I think that in today's day and age, um, you guys are really much more equipped than I was to sort of create these lanes for yourself. Um, you know, I always like to say that it's important to know who you are and know what it is that you like, know what you want to do, because, you know, my career and my whole like history is mine. Like, as I mean, I'm sure I'm in the lane of a lot of other people, a lot of other women or whatever, but if you break us down, we're all different. And so I think, um, you know, don't get caught up in recreating someone else's path. Because once you have an idea of what your path could look like, and that's the thing, it's like, if you have the vision for it, you can create it. So I think it's just about like creating a vision for yourself. Like maybe you grew up like being really good at baking and, you know, you thought it was just a hobby, but you can actually, you know, do something with that or, you know, um, you know, just, you can think outside the box. Basically anything is attainable you can create a career out of anything I mean and as artists I'm sure you are well aware like we tend to know more about what our skill set can can do and become um, so I think that's important I think what's also important is social media it's not something that I had in the beginning of my career but it really does help to understand social media and break it down like a science like there's a lot of um, you know, other influencers who seem probably like they don't have much of a skill set. And when in fact they do, like they, their Instagram looks incredible. And to have like a beautiful, aesthetically pleasing Instagram takes a, an eye, it takes work, it takes effort. And again, like I know for a, a lot of people that that still sounds a little absurd, but it's actually really true. A lot of brands will gravitate towards people who have an aesthetically pleasing Instagram and want to work with them and give them paychecks. So I think um, it's important to do that. If you're using your Instagram to share your work, that's awesome. Um, sharing things that inspire you, but also just making things. Like don't wait, don't only use your Instagram for jobs that like you, you know, big jobs. Like maybe it's styling your little sister because you're at home with her, you know, while you're doing virtual classes. Like doing something like having, you know, like a sibling acting out something or just there's so many different things that you can be doing that you never know will be viral, that will can go viral in a very artistic, creative way. I didn't mention this and we didn't talk about this, but one of the things that really kicked off my directing career was a music video I had done for, it was off of a Kanye mixtape. It was a music video called Us Placers. It was uh, basically, I use little kid versions of Kanye, Lupe, and Pharrell, and it wasn't a commission video. I just spent my own money doing it because, you know, post film school, I had done videos, and I just kind of felt like my career wasn't wasn't really moving the way I wanted it to, and I was kind of, you know, just really bored creatively, and I was like, oh, I want to make something, so I just made it for fun, and that video, I have to say, is the thing that really turned people on to my directing work, and it just goes to show like you don't have to wait for someone to give you a check or you know you don't have to like pitch yourself to someone and then say no like if you can just do something and create something with anything um and that can also you know put a light on your career and your skill set um and i think you know obviously what i do is very you know for some of you guys you're we're probably like very much focused on your one craft and that's amazing. I think that that's also very important. But for the people who are interested in doing things with like, you know, brands, like being an ambassador or modeling and all of those things, again, it's really just helpful for you to just be doing those things on your Instagram as if, like dot, 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 as if, like just pretend, like maybe pretend that you're doing a job for some headphone and how would you style it? How would you shoot it? How would you model in it? How would you film it? So thinking of things in terms of that is really helpful. Um, and yeah, and then I think if, you know, brands start to approach you, which you don't have to wait, you can always, you can always pitch yourself to brands. Um, but you can also tell them like, oh, I also direct, I can, I can art direct this. So it's like, that's also really great business wise and creatively, because then you have 
you know, sort of ownership over what you're doing, which is really nice. Instead of people telling you, okay, yeah, do it like this and make it look like that. Um, and I think that's important because if, you know, as creators, you have the opportunity to make something. So you don't, you know, we don't have to wait for people to tell us to do something. We can say, hey, okay, I have a vision for this too. And I would like to do this. And also being mindful of what the brand, what their legal or what their hashtag, all of those things, be mindful of those things, but also don't be afraid to say, you know, creatively what you can also bring to the table outside of just being a face or a person with followers. Well, that's great. I really am in awe of your career and in awe of all of the beautiful work you've created. Like I said, you know, many times there's there's so much great content on your website. It's Vashti.com and all of the music videos you've directed are up there. There's a bunch of commercials and some other short videos. Um, and I'm so glad that SVA has been able to play a part, a seemingly significant part uh, yeah. in, in your growth as an artist. So it's, it's so heartening to hear that. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you are continuing to create and we can't wait to see what's next. Um, all of your social media is of course linked through your website. So I hope people connect with you there. I wanna thank you so much for doing this with us this evening. Um, and I hope that we get to see a lot more of your work soon. Thank you for being here, Vashti. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed this Q&A and hope you'll check out our other after school special videos on the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thank you for your interest in and support of SVA and its alumni and for your support of the arts in general. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be well.